Welcome to Global News Today, bringing you exclusive insights and fresh perspectives from leading experts and influential decision makers every weekday on Al Arabiya News. I'm Tom Burgess Watson, coming up on today's program. A deadly Israeli airstrike hits the southern Beirut suburbs. In just a moment, I'll be speaking to the former Prime Minister of Lebanon, Fouad Asinura, for his take on these developments. Hezbollah, meanwhile, says a senior commander by the name of Ibrahim Akil was killed in that Israeli strike in Beirut. And as Israel conducts one of its most intense aerial bombardments on Lebanon, I'll be speaking to retired Major General in the Israeli Defense Forces and former head of the Israeli National Security Council, Giora Island. Welcome. We begin in the Lebanese capital, where there was a loud explosion this afternoon in the city's southern suburbs. This happened in an area of Beirut that is known to be a stronghold of Hezbollah. And the Israeli military said that it carried out what it called a targeted strike in that very area. Well, the Israeli military is redirecting its attention to the Lebanese border, where it faces frequent clashes with the militant group Hezbollah. Well, last night, Israel conducted one of its most intense aerial bombardments on Lebanon in the past year, targeting approximately 100 rocket launchers. And then today, Hezbollah said it had fired 140 rockets into northern Israel. Uh, that's also uh, backed up by the Israeli military. Well, the Israeli military reported that the rockets came in three waves, targeting sites along the border. Well, Hezbollah claimed it targeted several locations with Katusha rockets, including air defense bases and the headquarters of an Israeli armored brigade, which they said uh, they struck for the very first time. So that's the latest uh, on the ground in southern Lebanon. Our next guest is Fouad Asanyura, who served as prime minister of Lebanon from 2005 to 2009 before handing over to Saad Hariri. Thank you very much indeed for speaking to Al Arabiya News. Um, Israel has said more than once that they are at a new phase in their war. It seems that Lebanon is their focus. Is Lebanon on the brink of a full-scale war with Israel, do you think? First of all, thank you for inviting me to this uh, speech. And uh, yes, actually, Israel is now making every effort and missing no opportunity in order to expand the war and to the extent of really repeating uh, uh, what it really did in the past few days of two raids that are inhuman and, uh, and, and very bloody. And today, actually, they made a third, uh, a third uh, 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 let's say, attempt to kill one, but at the end, a number of civilians were killed in this, uh, in this operation. Actually, what appears that Israel wants to drag the region into a full-scale war. Effectively, what has been taken place, particularly in the light of the speech that was made by Hassan Nasrallah uh, yesterday, he tried to soften things and keep things in order to really think more. And definitely, everybody will think, but the, the attempt that was made by Israel today is actually dragging the region into a full-scale war. You recently said, though, that Lebanon cannot survive another war. I'm quoting you from an article, so do correct me if I'm wrong in saying that. Uh, but that would imply that the stakes are extremely high for Lebanon. Very much so. Actually, uh, if I can remind you that on the 8th of October, on 23, on Sunday, uh, in the morning of Sunday, I made a statement a public statement in saying that this operation that was made by, by Hamas has managed to really bring back the Palestinian cause back onto the table so that uh, the world will try to really uh, uh, respond and try at the same time to find a solution in the implementation of all the resolutions of the United Nations and the Security Council and the Madrid Conference and the Oslo Agreement and the rest of all these agreements which were not, were not finding its, its way towards implementation. But I mentioned on that day that Lebanon cannot afford to be dragged into such a war because Lebanon is passing through very difficult crises, several ones. 
And I mentioned at that time, five, five crises. We don't, have, we don't have a president and we cannot really form a new government. We have a, 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 a real problem, economic problem. And, and living conditions are bad, very bad. We have the, the problem of the Syrian refugees. And we do not have a, a full-scale agreement among the Lebanese to really to get uh, in, involved in such a war. There is no agreement and support for this. And at the same, at the same time, the first cause, because Le Le Lebanon does not have the, the, the support and the, and the network of, uh, let's say, the, uh, the, the Arab relations and the world relations to support Lebanon as much as we really had in, in, in 2006. So on that basis, I said Lebanon cannot afford. And things were really dragging all the way since uh, the, 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 the 8th of October until now we are about to close one year. And Lebanon is really suffering. And effectively, all matters are leading towards uh, very difficult times for Lebanon. And that's why we say that it is very important that something has to be done, whether it is a real pressure that can be made by, uh, by the United States and by the, the, the international community, because every day it seems clear now that Israel is changing its position, and every day they're coming with new conditions for a, 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 a truce or a, 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 to, 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 to end the existing war. So this, this, this situation, I think, that is going to really drag the whole region into a, a major confrontation. God knows what really come, comes out of it. So something has to be done in the international community. I think the, the Lebanese government has to really make a real serious stand. And I really commend the, 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 the intention of the Lebanese prime minister to uh, really fly back, fly, go to, to Washington, to, to New York, in order to really be listened there uh, by the international community in the, in the uh, General Assembly, as well as probably in the Security Council. Something has to be done, and it is enough, enough, and enough, actually, that uh, the United States is giving the, the, the Israelis a blank check to really on the, on the basis of defending itself, but actually what it is, it is a license to kill. So this is the situation that we cannot afford any more things to be done as such. We always hear the United States uh, making lots of noise about really putting an end to this war, but in the, in the real sense of the word, we are finding that it is extending the, the license to kill to the, to, to the Israelis. And today, even its response regarding the, the raid that was made uh, on, on the, in, in Dahi in Beirut, again, has given the Israelis uh, the right to, to, uh, to uh, pursue its, uh, its attempts to kill some leaders of, of Hezbollah, which ended up in the killing of civilians, as much as they, it did in the past few days with, the, with this Te technological attempt that is clearly uh, Israel has has uh, has been doing things uh, below the belt, as they say. But were Hezbollah to stop firing uh, rockets across the border uh, into northern Israel, surely Israel would respond and 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 cease uh, returning fire. What, what do you make of that argument? Well, actually, I think uh, what, 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 what Nasrallah has, has said uh, uh, yesterday is something that, you, that they could have built on it. And there is something else, as actually, that the, the uh, Saudi Arabia has made in the, in the uh, actually, what, uh, what uh, the Crown Prince has said, uh, Prince Mohammed uh, bin Salman. He said something very important that it has to be picked up by, by the Israelis and picked up by everybody. It, it has really reconfirmed that it is ready to, 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 to establish relations with Israel on the basis of the recognition, full recognition of the Israelis to have, uh, to, to, uh, to approve the creation of a new Palestinian state, uh, fully, fully with full authorities as, uh, as a state, as a sovereign state. So this is something that these messages are being, are being sent to the Israelis, but I think the group of of extremists huh, uh, in, in Israel are not listening, are not trying to really listen. And what we are seeing, I can really use this term, 
it is because uh, uh, the uh, the uh, Netanyahu with he has he has his his, his he has his own own um, own own in interests actually, but which I can I can name it to be uh, micro ambitions and macro consequences, in the sense that. Uh, 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 Netanyahu is trying to avoid the downfall of its government with what are the consequences that might take place. And that's why he's pushing forward like, uh, like riding a bicycle. If he doesn't really push, push forward, he will fall. So this is what he is doing. I think something has to be done by the international community and by the Israelis. I think it's enough enough what has been done by the Arab world and by the Islamic world by stating uh, their commitment to to uh, the 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 Arab Peace Initiative that was is, that was made by 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 the by the Arab Summit and actually brought forward by by Prince Abdullah at that time the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia. So these are the things that one has to really do something about it. If we continue just to listen to nice words by, by by the United States and knowing that that United States is not ready to do anything because they are the United States is very busy with what is happening now regarding the the uh, the uh, the elections the presidential elections i think we will end up by leaving things for the 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 uh, let's say the the interests of Netanyahu to to do all what he thinks it is in his interest Help us understand how, how things work in Lebanon. Does Hezbollah listen to uh, politicians and statesmen like you? Does it listen to advice? Or do orders simply come from Tehran and they, they follow them? So were, what I'm trying to say is were people to reason with Hezbollah and, and try to give constructive advice or construct some sort of shuttle diplomacy between the two sides and prevent this full-scale war uh, from, being, uh, from, from starting in the first place, would they, be, would they listen in the first place? Well, what has been going on for the past, uh, let's say, uh, uh, 15 years uh, is that uh, uh, things were uh, uh, left unattended to in proper words so that really uh, Lebanon is falling like a prey uh, in, the, in the hands of the Iranians. And the Iranians are really forcing things as they uh, find it is in their interest. And Hezbollah is doing the same thing. So uh, instead of actually of creating a vacuum by the absence of the, let's say, the Arab, the Arab world and the international community of not doing much uh, to really help Lebanon, uh, it's not only by, by trying to really bring people together in order to have the, let's say, the election of a new president, but more than that, it's something that has to be uh, really uh, done in order to support the, the people who are for the, the complete sovereignty of the, of, of the country. So Lebanon at the present time, effectively, it is in the hands and in the, uh, in the, uh, under, let us say, the control of Hezbollah and in turn under the control of the Iranians. This is something where, uh, what we had a chance actually uh, to, to start creating a change in this regard during the elections and we found out that everybody uh, uh, withdrew and not to really help in order to help the, those who believe in this full sovereignty of the country. There was not a proper help that was extended and that really what really happened. So there was a great deal of, uh, of abstention from participating in the, in the elections that took place in the 222. So we are now uh, sowing the, 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 the mistakes that, uh, that have been uh, done at that time. Nevertheless, now we are here. What, what has to be done? I think there is something that has to be done on behalf of the Lebanese government and on behalf of the international community. The Lebanese government, I think I commend what, uh, what uh, Prime Minister uh, Najib Miati is doing to go and to really be listened at the Security Council and the and the uh, General Assembly of United Nations, United Nations. And at the same time, something has to be done by, by, by the Americans. I cannot really accept what, uh, what uh, uh, a spokesman on behalf of the, of the, uh, the American administration saying that it, uh, uh, Israel has the right to, 
to pursue its attempts to to really kill the uh, the some leaders of uh, of the Hezbollah as if they are giving uh, a blank check to, to Israel to to continue uh, uh, attempting to to uh, do what what it likes uh, as i can see it now that uh, this this attempt today of of uh, this this raid that was made by Israel it is as if Israel is pushing Hezbollah to fall in the abyss. This is something, it's not only Hezbollah, it is falling in the abyss. Early Lebanon will fall in it and Israel will fall in it. Because let's go back to see what really happened since, since October 8 uh, and October 7 of 223. I mean, Israel has killed that, that many, 42,000 at least. Uh, and has injured and incapacitated over 100,000 and has practically has uh, raised Gaza to the, to the ground. But what it really uh, resulted, now, uh, now, now uh, uh, actually Israel is in a, in a very deep situation. And effectively, it cannot really get out of it, no matter what it does. And now they are finding a way of compensating what they could not achieve in Gaza to really do it in, 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 in Lebanon. Type. Fine. Now, if they want to really attack Lebanon, what will happen? Again, they will, they will get into, into a very deep, deep crisis in, in this because it, it will end up with, with more killing and more destruction. And what they have put as an objective for, the, for this, this, uh, this battle, as they say, to get the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Israelis that immigrated from northern Israel to, 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 uh, to the mid of, midst of Israel, I think they will not get back. Things will get worse, and they will have more immigrants uh, or uh, refugees coming from, from the north of Israel. So it doesn't really achieve the, the More killing does not achieve any result. Killing, uh, let's say, selectively more, one and more, uh, persons will not really get results. It is something that has to be done towards finding a long permanent solution. What Crown Prince uh, um, Mohammed bin Salman has said is the right thing, and it falls in the, at the right time by sending this message to the world and to the Israelis and to the, to, to the uh, American administration that something has to be done to, like, to make these people come to come back to their senses. As long as they continue what they are doing, we are not moving towards peace. We are moving, moving towards more, more wars and to expand and more killing. And things would go out of, out, of, out of control. Particularly if we look at the world situation, what you have a situation that is very shaky, very shaky and very vulnerable, what's happening in Europe, What's happening in, in, uh, in, in South America? What's happening in South uh, uh, China Sea? And all these are, are, in, are indicators that something wrong is, is happening. If we are going to leave things as they are, they will get more getting, let's say, uh, more, more complicated. And as you can see, what do you call it? Connected vessels. Things will get in, involved here and there and will create problems here and there. It becomes very difficult to put an end to it. To it. In the event that uh, things do escalate and a war breaks out between Lebanon and uh, between Israel and, and Hezbollah, yes. is it an inevitability that everyone in Lebanon would rally around Hezbollah and it would be a Lebanon-Israel war or would it remain uh, somehow or other, were a hybrid war or, or directed uh, attacks like the ones we saw today uh, carried out by Israel, would it remain between these two parties or would the whole country, would the whole of Lebanon necessarily be implicated? Well, let me tell you something. As I said, uh, that uh, when, when Hezbollah made this, uh, let's say, uh, uh, step towards getting involved in this war, there was little people who really were supporting him. Probably I was the first to talk about it, but I mean many, they expressed their opinion that they are against it. And now people are against it. But if things will, will get more complicated, definitely people 
not to come to the rescue of Hezbollah. They want to come to the rescue of Lebanon. They want to defend Lebanon. So this, this thing, I mean, instead of leaving things to get more complicated, let's put an end to it now and avoid having a full-scale war. Your government was the first government, I believe, to uh, include representatives from Hezbollah. Just looking back on it, was it a mistake to include them, do you think? Well, no, I don't think so, Yanni. We, that was a step to really attract Hezbollah to become a political party rather than a military party. But, I mean, uh, th that was the assumption and that was the thing that should have been done. But uh, actually, things were getting more, more and more complicated. And uh, uh, definitely, the uh, regional, regional attempts to really use Hezbollah as, uh, as, uh, as a weapon in the negotiation that was taking place and still taking place between Iran and the United States. So what we are seeing nowadays, again, I mean, part of it appearing uh, fighting the war uh, uh, for Palestine and for Gaza and for Lebanon, but effectively it is, again, it is a weapon that is used uh, by, by, by Hezbollah in order to, to really, to, for the benefit of, the, uh, of Iran. So effectively by attracting Hezbollah at that time to become, let's say, a political party was a legitimate uh, attempt. And things were, let's say, uh, regional conditions were uh, possible and helpful. Huh? And uh, at, the, at that time, you see, we were attempting to start talking with, the, with Hezbollah to find out ways and means of sorting problems. And what really happened at that time, following several attempts, you know, and, uh, and uh, and several attempts of assassinations and the like that was happening during the, the, the second half of, of 2005 and the, begin, and the first half of 2006. Uh, the, the, the Israeli invasion against Lebanon has complicated things. Instead of bringing Hezbollah back to become a political party, what has happened is that the other way around. So this is the situation. And you were Prime Minister. There is something that one has to see clearly and to, yeah, go ahead. Sure, I was going to say, I mean, you were Prime Minister of Lebanon in 2006 right. uh, during the July uh, war with Israel. And I just wanted to yes. ask you how, how it makes you feel uh, to see your country 20 years on nearly still rocked by turmoil and held hostage by the actions of Hezbollah and Israel. How does that make you feel? Definitely very sad. Definitely very sad. I really attempted every, every effort in order to save, to save Lebanon. And we have done everything in order to come up with the Resolution 1701. But effectively, it was neither implemented by Hezbollah and neither implemented by Israel. Um, this, is, this is the situation, you see. One has to really build, build on, on a certain achievement to really ascend to another achievement. What this has been going on, when we make one achievement, it, then it, 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 is, it happens something to the contrary, and that we, we descend and into, into a, a different abyss. I, I think that it is very important to really move towards, not decide issues, Hezbollah issue is a side issue. But the major issue is to really get the Arab cause away from being uh, 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 swallowed by the, by the Iranians. Iranians are using the Arab cause as a way of improving their negotiating power of the United States and trying to improve their and, and increase their control over several countries in the region. I mean Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and Yemen. So in order to get rid of this situation, you do not look into the small things to the side issues. The main issue is there. Instead of leaving things to be, to be used by Iran, you have to save the region from being used by Iran and then to direct the region towards real full peace. And full peace has to be on the basis of the, the, uh, the, Arab, uh, the Arab initiative, 
uh, of, of 201, the Arab Peace Initiative. You wrote this really is the, what you call it the real the real the way how. I was just going to say, you wrote a great uh, opinion piece earlier on this year, and in it, I can quote you as saying, the Israelis need to grasp that the best antidote to Iranian expansionism is a two-state solution. Uh, and clearly, a two-state solution would make uh, Lebanon uh, much safer uh, as well. Um, but after these tragic 12 months uh, in Gaza, the West Bank and Israel, I mean, that solution is looking more distant than perhaps at any time in living memory, isn't it? Yeah, it's not only it's not at only saving Lebanon, saving Syria, saving Iraq, and saving Yemen, saving the international trade, saving the international peace. This is the way how to really look at matters, and not to really you know, the, the, going into this, the what you call it the side streets, the alleys. Go to the main road. The main road is there. How to save the region, of of really finding a real long long term. Uh, uh, solution, a uh, just solution, and permanent ones. This is, this is the way how to look at things. And I think what, what has been said by, by, by Prince Mohammed bin, bin Salman today is, uh, yesterday, is very important and essential to build, to build on it and to really advance on, 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 the, on this initiative rather than wasting our time by, by uh, this attack and that attack and so on and so forth. Will not lead anywhere. It will complicate the matters. And I've been mean, falling, falling in the trap that was made by the Iranians. It is very important. As long as this trap is continue, continuously being put by the Iranians, we are not going to get out of this by looking at the side streets and side issues but, but not, and not to the, towards the main issues. Uh, we're coming to the end of this interview. I just want to ask you, I saw a picture of you uh, together with the current uh, Prime Minister, who you've mentioned a number of times, also the former Prime Minister, Tamam Salam. Uh, and I just wanted to ask you, do you continue to have an active role in, in, yeah. in Lebanese politics behind the scenes? And are you giving advice to, to the current government? Yes, let me tell you something. I have took, I've taken a decision by, at the end of my term uh, as an MP after having served, served for about 10 years as a, as a minister of finance and about five years as a prime minister and about nine years as, as a member of the parliament, I took my decision. I'm not uh, pursuing any more, any position, but I am still very active politically and I am, I am doing every possible effort in order to, to really assemble efforts and join efforts towards really making a change. Uh, I was the one who has suggested the, the formation of the, the club of the former prime ministers. And we are uh, meeting uh, uh, periodically, uh, uh, every other week at, at, uh, at, uh, at the least, you see. And uh, we, uh, we continue to exchange views and support when, whenever it is uh, needed to support and d d uh, saying our, our opinion whenever it is necessary to do so. Uh, this is my last question, and this is for the benefit of people watching who might be thinking, when they read about Lebanese politics, they read about uh, often dramatic events, they read about stalemate, they read about infighting, even assassinations. What would you say is wrong with Lebanese politics? Yeah. Well, normally in, 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 in the media, uh, uh, you see, there is, there, is a, there is a joke, they say it, uh, uh, people of the media, that when, when, a, when a dog bites a man, it is not a news. But when a man bites uh, a dog, that's news, you see. So this is what they say in the media. Well, actually, uh, there is something wrong in, in Lebanese politics, which is something that I attempted personally in a series, series of attempts to introduce real reform in the, in the, in, in the Lebanese politics. One, one of that, let's say, one of that was uh, uh, really uh, uh, making it a law and to be practiced as such that appointments in all positions 
uh, in, in government uh, offices and uh, in all public sector uh, institutions and, uh, and uh, uh, the like in the army and the internal security and so on, based on, on merit, as what I, I mean by that meritocracy. And in this, it solves the problem, uh, a very deep problem in the country, and stops, let's say, the control that is being uh, practiced by the Lebanese politicians and by the various families uh, in order to impose their control over their voters. And that, uh, in, that, in that respect, uh, every, uh, every individual in Lebanon finds himself with this, with this system that whatever he really expects as a service from the government, he cannot take it without really going through his za'im, his, his representative in the parliament and so, so that he can arrange for him to get his right. So this is something very bad, you see. And I tried this and attempted several times. And in certain aspects, I, I made, an, an, uh, let's say, uh, 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 um, an, an important achievement. But later on, it was not pursued. So this is one. There's something else that I attempted in the, in the, in the Lebanese parliament, which is something that uh, uh, very important. We have, we have done it during the second half of 2005 in terms of a reform. Uh, which is based on the Constitution, that all the constitutional powers, which is the, the leg legislative as well as the executive powers, they are supposed to be hand-in-hand, uh, hand, independent, and, and, and uh, not, to, not to make any one step steps on the other. So there was some sort of an attempt to have a type of government in Lebanon, which is all, all uh, uh, u u u unity government which it ends up all unity government is something that, is, that happens in, in all democracies, but for a certain period of time, and at the end of a certain crisis, they go back to real democracy. Democracy, there is a majority and a minority. The, the advantage of that, the, 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 the majority really uh, uh, be, be in government, and the minority is not supposed to be marginalized, the minority, but it tries to really criticize and try to affect a downfall of the majority. But this is democracy. What I have done in this, in agreement with, with the Speaker of the House, Nabi Barri, we arranged that we had something very similar to what really takes place in all major democracies, in the United States, in, 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 in England, as well in France, which are having what you call it, the Q&A time, the weekly meeting, as actually a uh, weekly meeting to hold the government ac uh, accountable. And we managed to have that for a period of about, about five months. But effectively, what really happened later on, uh, the speaker decided to stop it, while actually this is a very good, important step towards the implementation of a proper democracy, whereby every, uh, I mean, every week, uh, the, the General Assembly of the, of the Parliament convenes, and uh, the, the, the uh, any member of the Parliament, he speaks for three minutes, not to have long sessions and long speech and to show everybody that he, he knows how to, how, to, how, to, how to speak and to, how to improvise. Actually, what he has a certain question for three minutes, and then the government answers. If it, has, if it doesn't have an answer, they will ask him to uh, really de de delay it for the, next, the, 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 the second week. And if he doesn't get the right answer, he has the right to question the government, and he has to have the to ask the, the vote of confidence in the government. This is how to really make the, the democracy really uh, 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 work. This is something was not done, and I have reminded the speaker of the house so many times over the past de decade, and he says yes, 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 and nothing, nothing really happens. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. We're out of time. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us, uh, Fouad Asanura, former Prime Minister of Lebanon. Thank you for speaking to Thank Al Arabiya News. Thank you. From the White House to Gaza, Kiev to Beijing, elections, economics, and the environment compete with conflicts and other complex issues for our attention. In an age of fake news, deep fake, and artificial intelligence, they've got to have a vote and a say. It's important to look beyond the loudest voice to understand the truth. 
from newsmakers to groundbreakers. My campaign is going very well. Presidents, prime ministers, princes and peacemakers, and cultural tastemakers. As Arabs, as Middle Eastern, we're too emotional. Join me on The Riz Khan Show for empowering conversation. Well, for more on this, I'm joined now by Giora Island, who is a retired major general in the Israel Defense Forces and a former head of the Israeli National Security Council. Thank you so much for joining us, Major General. Um, you've been quite critical of Israel's response to the 7th of October attacks right from the beginning. And I just wanted to start by asking you, what's been at the core of your criticism? Are you saying that Israel was too lenient or too harsh in Gaza? Uh, neither one. Um... Uh, if we understand what really happened on the 7th of October, then the best way to uh, present it would be that uh, on that day, uh, the state of Gaza began a war against Israel. They killed uh, about 1,200 Israelis. Most of them were civilians. They did capture or kidnap about 250 Israelis. Again, most of them are civilians. And this was a very vicious and brutal surprise attack. Now, just imagine what would happen if something similar uh, could be in Europe when the small state of Luxembourg would do something similar to its bigger neighbor, Belgium. We can assume that if it happened in uh, between Belgium and Luxembourg, then the immediate Belgium response would be to cut all the supplies from their area to small Luxembourg and to say, well, at least, at least, uh, we are not going to let any supply going from Belgium to Luxembourg that does not have any uh, any uh, any access to the uh, to the sea, uh, and we will do it at least until you return with no conditions all the 250 Belgium citizens that you kidnap. So that's exactly what we should have done on the very first day of that war, and today's war, if we can speak about the 21st century wars. The most important matter is not the uh, military force or the uh, ability to use, uh, let's say, uh, uh, to, to carry out military strikes. The most important matter is to use the, the uh, relevant advantage that you have over your opponents and the real advantage that Israel had and still have over the state of Gaza is that the, all the uh, entrance and exits to Gaza and from Gaza are fully controlled by Israel. So we should have done something similar to that. And if it happened, we could be long time ago after the end of the war with all the Israeli hostages back with much less Israeli casualties and with much less uh, civilian Palestinian casualties. And this was the core of my criticism at that time. OK, so it's principally about the strategy rather than the, the leniency or the, uh, the excessive harshness. I want to ask you about um, something that surfaced on social media in the last 24 hours or so. We've, we've all seen these pictures of um, IDF soldiers throwing bodies off a roof. Uh, I, I believe that happened uh, in the occupied West Bank. We're not going to show those pictures here on uh, Al Arabiya because they're, they're pretty sickening. But what's your reaction to that? Do we agree that this was a, a crime? I, I don't know. I did not see it. Actually, I, uh, it's Friday today. Friday, I'm trying not to walk. Uh, so I, I'm not sure that I know the story that you're talking about. And anyway, we're focusing on our northern border with uh, Lebanon. So I actually have no idea what you're talking about and I cannot respond. We've had lots of guests on this channel who've said in the last week that they believe that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's principal motivation is simply to stay in power and out of jail. Do you agree with that assessment? Well, usually I prefer whenever I speak to foreign uh, networks not to speak about the internal Israeli uh, problems, but to try to explain what we do on the eight, floor, uh, eight fronts that we are uh, uh, confronting right now. We have uh, eight fronts that are fighting against Israel. So, yes, we do have problems with our leadership. I don't like the way that the prime minister behaves. I'm not sure that all his considerations are based on purely national interest. And uh, I do explain many things domestically in Israel, but I prefer to explain if you want to know what is the real 
let's say, uh, problem here uh, during this, uh, let's say, eight uh, fronts of war, rather than to uh, go to, let's say, to internal Israeli politics. Um, and, regard, uh, go ahead. So, with your permission, it is important to understand because uh, most, uh, let's say, reporters and analysts all over the world fail to understand the core of the problem. The core of the problem is a dangerous uh, um, uh, combination of two elements that are not known only in Israeli problem. It is going to be very shortly a problem of the Middle East and maybe of, also of the West. And this is the two elements that actually uh, um, uh, describe the Iranian strategy. The first one is to take, uh, let's say, uh, uh, weak countries, some of them are failed countries like Lebanon, Yemen, Syria, Iraq, and others, and uh, they build an internal uh, pro-Iranian militia inside those countries. Those militias get a lot of ammunition um, and, um, and uh, training and money from Iran, so they, uh, they become stronger and stronger and more and more influential. So it is like a cancer that spread inside the body of a country. So at some point, the country is actually not uh, able and not accountable for what is happening within the countries, but uh, uh, everything is done according to the pro-Iranian militia. And as I said, you can see uh, a, perfect a perfect example in Lebanon, a perfect example in Yemen, and partial example, example in Iraq and Syria. But uh, the Iranians uh, have a very, very big appetite, and they want to see a very similar uh, developments in Jordan, in Sudan, in Bahrain, and at some point, maybe also Saudi Arabia and other countries. And in each country, they do find, let's say, a call for position uh, that they support strongly in order to make them a very loyal pro-Iranian militia. So this is one element. But in the past five years, we could see the, end, the second element in this strategy, and this is to arm all those militias with very, very advanced military capabilities. So they are not the terrorist organi organizations that have an RPG and, uh, and Kalachnikov. Uh, how many countries in the world have a capacity of the, uh, the Houthis in Yemen that can launch uh, uh, missiles to a range of 2,000 kilometers? How many countries in the world have such an arsenal like Hezbollah? And similarly, we can speak about Hamas and other militias in the region. So the combination of these two elements will actually break down the structure of the states in the Middle East and will bring a lot of instability, even more than that, first to the Middle East and later to other areas. So Israel is fighting, of course, for itself, but whenever we fight against those militias and against uh, um, Iran, we are doing a great favor to the West, and this is something that should be, uh, let's say, strongly emphasized. So you're basically saying that we are heading towards a broader regional conflict. Are you saying that's an inevitability now? Uh, uh, this is, uh, again, uh, this is something that Iran wants, and they said uh, actually almost openly, not to mention that for the past 25 years, the Supreme Leader say again and again, that his goal, his vision, let's say his legacy, is to destroy Israel and to wipe Israel off the map. This is, let's say, clearer policy. And the strategy of all those proxies is actually to serve this, uh, uh, this goal. So whenever we speak about Hamas, Hezbollah, and others, and we ask ourselves, what is their, let's say, political goal? Their political goal is to eliminate Israel and to kill all the Jews who live here. It is not about any territorial dispute or any other dispute. So it brings me actually to the main front today, and this is the front in Lebanon or with Lebanon. Uh, just yesterday, we could hear uh, uh, the chairman of uh, Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah, who said in very clear ways, uh, words, I'm not going to stop this war, I will continue. And as far as he's concerned, he's not really uh, interested to see a uh, a total war between his organization and Israel, but he prefers to continue with this kind of attrition war, and in order to give uh, full support to his speech, uh, Hezbollah launched about uh, 140 rockets again against Israeli northern uh, areas uh, only today. 
So actually, uh, we are at war, uh, not only in, with Hezbollah on this front, but whenever we speak about this area, the war is actually between the state of Israel and the state of Lebanon, because the state of Lebanon and Hezbollah are actually one entity. And the control of Lebanon is in the hands of Hezbollah. So no matter who has different title, the real leadership, the real, uh, let's say, regime in Lebanon is a regime of uh, Hezbollah that is working uh, openly uh, for the Iranian interest. And this is something that we would expect the West to understand, if not to support. I mean, Hamas has been severely weakened, hasn't it, by these last 11 months. Um, a lot of analysts saying it can never be completely destroyed. It's an ideology and you can't destroy an ideology. That's their argument. At what point do you think Israel will say uh, it's achieved as much as it can in Gaza and it's time to end the operation? What would that point be? OK, I, I tend to agree with you for the first time in this interview uh, that uh, one of the uh, ways to try to calm down the situation is uh, to reach a simple deal uh, in Gaza that was based on two simple elements. Number one, a full return of all the Israeli hostages in one uh, step, uh, and in return, a complete cessation of violence and the end of the war in Gaza, and a withdrawal of all the Israeli forces from the Gaza Strip. I agree that this is something that today is probably within the interest of many other parties, not only of Israel. Uh, and this is something that uh, I'm not sure that uh, Hamas is interested in such a deal, uh, but this is something that can be done. And uh, there are uh, reconsiderations in Israel whether or not to adapt something like this. I'm not sure that uh, uh, Ikhya Sinwar, the leader of Hamas, will accept it because, yes, of course, he wants to end this war and he wants to stay in power. But unfortunately, it does not uh, feel any real pressure. It does not feel pressure because uh, actually Israel uh, continued to supply his government with about 300, 400 trucks of supply every day, not only with, uh, let's say, elementary food, but also with uh, fruits, fresh fruits and shampoos and uh, whatever. Uh, number two, uh, this uh, supply is delivered by his own people, by Hamas. So Hamas is perceived by the population as an organization that take care of them, so they don't have any reason to resist and to be, uh, let's say, uh, frustrated. Number three, uh, Hamas gets all this uh, uh, supply for free and he resell it in a very, very high prices to the population, so every day it becomes richer and richer. There are some assessments that from the beginning of the war until now, uh, the uh, profit of Hamas only from this supply reached something like half a billion dollars, which is quite an impressive figure. And number four, because he has so much money, it is very simple for him to hire more and more combatants. So uh, I'm not sure that uh, Sinoa will ex accept such a formula uh, because he does not feel any real pressure. And the military pressure by nature Again, in the walls of the 21st century is limited, and especially it is limited because of the structure of Gaza and mainly the tunnels, hundreds of kilometers of tunnels below the ground that enable uh, the leadership of uh, Hamas to feel quite confident and to continue with the war. Of course, he hopes that there will be escalation on all other fronts, so he would achieve whatever he, he really dreams of, and this is a total war of all the Arab countries and all the nations around us against us. Just lastly, this is my last question to you. Uh, back in April, uh, you're quoted as saying in the Times of Israel that the Israeli leadership doesn't listen to the United States. Um, I just want to be clear with you here. Why do you think Israel isn't listening to the United States? And just looking forwards to the election in the United States, do you think Israel is more likely to listen uh, if there's a change, uh, a, a large change of regime in the White House, a large change of administration and Donald Trump returns to the White House, would that change something, do you think, in terms of uh, whether or not Israel is listening to, uh, to the U.S.? Uh, unfortunately, from the beginning of this war and actually from a time that uh, began something like two years ago, from the establishment of this current Israeli government, the dialogue between uh, Israel and the United States is poor. 
It is full with uh, mistrust, misunderstandings, uh, even uh, bold uh, conflicts of, uh, if not of interest, at least of expressions of interest. And uh, we have to be very uh, sorry for that because uh, one of the element of the Israeli national security uh, uh, strategy uh, is to have a very, very close and reliable and friendly uh, relations with the United States. And unfortunately, yes, the Israeli Prime Minister uh, made a lot of mistakes along the past 22 years. And uh, actually, we are paying the price for that. Uh, some people say uh, that uh, his real hope is to make or is to wait until the election in America. He hopes that Trump, Trump would uh, win, and then he would be able maybe to recover the relationship, have uh, better uh, understandings, or even agree to certain things that the United States might say. But he wants to give, let's say, this reward to Trump rather than to Biden and Harris. And I think it is a very, number one, dangerous uh, approach. It is not a very ethical one. And it cannot be done if uh, the damage is to the uh, national interest of Israel. So, yes, I have a lot of complaints uh, against the way that uh, our government is um, uh, behaving. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that our enemies are the good guys and we are fighting in the wrong way or uh, we are doing something that we should not do. Uh, on the battlefield, I think that we are doing uh, whatever we have to do in order to defend our country and our nation. And as I said again, unfortunately, it is not well understood and not well appreciated by the West, although we are at least indirectly are serving the interest of the West. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. We're out of time. Thank you very much indeed, retired Major General Gyura Island. Thank you very much indeed for speaking to Al Arabian okay. News. You're welcome. Bye bye. As tensions between Israel and Lebanon escalate, how are these developments going to impact Jordan and its role in maintaining regional stability and also the broader implications for Middle Eastern geopolitics? Well, to help us answer those questions is the former Jordanian Minister of the Interior, Hossein Majali. Thank you very much indeed for speaking to us. Um, Jordan's in a really delicate position, isn't it, navigating relations with Israel in the context of what's happening in Gaza and the West Bank. Just how challenging is this for your country? Uh, good evening, sir. Well, uh, I tell you something, it is extremely challenging because uh, things in the region are volatile, especially in the uh, Gaza region and in the West Bank and on the northern borders or the southern borders of Lebanon. Uh, so it, it is like you're walking on a tightrope. But uh, if you allow me to inter interject just for half a minute on your uh, on the previous guest that was talking to you. And I'm, I'm, I'm surprised from a professional military officer to mention the analogy of, 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 of Luxembourg and Belgium. I would like to ask him that and tell him that Belgium has not occupied Luxembourg for the past 70 some years. And it has not put some part of Luxembourg under full blockade. So, and as for the number of the uh, Israelis lost their lives on the 7th of October. All media reports have said that a good number of them were shot by the IDF themselves. So it's just a correction of this. And I'm surprised from a military officer also to say that he wanted to put Gaza under starvation. I remember Gaza also lost 41,000 people to date. And this is not a number you, 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 you take it lightly. So this is my answer just for your previous guest. Okay, thanks for, for pointing that out to us. Um, let's talk about what's happening in, in Jordan in particular, because the Islamic Action Front, uh, which is affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, became the largest, parliament, uh, the largest party in parliament when they won about 30 seats. That's out of 138. Um, how is this going to affect Jordan's position with regards to the situation in Gaza? Do you think it will affect it? I, I personally, honestly, that do not think it will affect very much. First of all, it's, uh, 
it has, a, as you've stated, it has a 31 seats, which is about 22 some percent of the uh, of the bloc of the parliament. And when Jordan ratified the peace treaty of, of with the with the state of Israel, Islamic Brotherhood was in parliament in 1995. So, and, and they had almost that number, just a bit short of it, in one percent. So. Uh, I would like to say, definitely the Gaza and the West Bank disturbances and all the operations going there has affected the result of the elections, where I believe it, it played in favor of the, uh, action, the Islamic Action Front, and it gave them that, seat, that, 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 that number of seats. But will they be any, uh, uh, will they play a major role in like ending the, the peace treaty or changing the course of the state? Well, the course of the state is, is, is really forward going. His Majesty the King has voiced his concern and he's very forward moving in, 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 in condemning the Israeli actions in Gaza and in the West Bank. But, and also remember the Islamic uh, Front is a member of the Jordanian society. We, we cannot alienate somebody who has come to the parliament via the ballot. They came via the ballot. You agree with them, you disagree with them, they came via the ballot and 463,000 people voted for them, voted for the bloc that is on the, not for the 31 because they're split into two, uh, 17, they came on the, on the party of the action front, and the other ones on local elections. So uh, do you think that the war in, in Gaza was at the forefront of the minds of people as they voted there in Jordan? Uh, the war itself, and more importantly, the, 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 the everyday results of the aggression, the number of people who've been maimed, the, the, the genocide, the inhumane uh, treatment of Palestinians in Gaza and in the West Bank. By the way, the West Bankers have not attacked on the 7th of October. They didn't do anything on the 7th of October. So, no, definitely, definitely it had a, a the optics, uh, the optics, and, and you know the special relationship between Jordan and, 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 and Palestine, and occupied Palestine. It is a very strong relationship. There are family ties, there are uh, a, what we call it is marriages and all this. So it, it, it hits home, it hits home. For you, sir, you get affected if something happened in Japan. How about if something happens next door to you and they are your next of kin? This is only a very normal reaction to what is happening. Definitely, yes. Sure, and there have been quite a lot of protests, haven't there, in recent months, uh, people taking to the streets saying that the, the treaty with Israel that uh, will celebrate 30 years, actually, next month, they're saying that that treaty should be scrapped. I mean, this puts the Jordanian government in a difficult position, doesn't it? How, how do you think they're likely to react, and could that treaty be in jeopardy? So first of all, I was the head of the uh, Public Security Directorate, which is in charge of internal security. We had this protest. A, a, very soon, it will, we will uh, commemorate 30 years. Those protests have been going on for 30 years. Uh, different times, different uh, peaks, lows of the numbers, but it's been going on all the time. So I personally don't think at all it will affect. I think what will affect the peace treaty is Israel's action in Gaza and in the West Bank. Jordanian officials uh, have frequently pointed the finger at Iran and said that Iran is perhaps trying to destabilize the kingdom. Do you think there's much evidence of that? And could this be an example of it? Sir, I... Uh, I, I personally think, I could be way wrong, but I, 
I think nowadays for the past six months, Israel has been playing a bigger role in that than, than we can uh, point at Iran. Definitely Iran has its uh, uh, interest in the region and Jordan is part of the region. And uh, uh, most of the, let's say, the, 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 the satellite forces or, 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 or the proxy forces for Iran, they are around Jordan. And, and, and we are the only uh, steady and strong pillar uh, not allowing uh, that uh, those uh, proxy groups to, to penetrate Jordan. And uh, so uh, I am sure that there are uh, uh, actions or, 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 or doing things to, to affect Jordan using specifically the northern borders, our northern borders with Syria, to smuggle weapons, drugs, and uh, to try to stabilize the uh, security and peace and tranquility of Jordan. But the Jordan public, the armed forces, the security forces are very vigilant, extremely vigilant on that. And we will not allow. You know, we are not a banana republic. We are a strong kingdom based on laws, based on a very strong social cohesion, and this will not be allowed at all for someone to try and destabilize Jordan. We are one person, we are one country in one person. The Turkish uh, Foreign Minister Hakan Fidan said earlier on this week that is, there is this risk of a war that could involve eventually Jordan, Egypt, the entire region. I'd like to ask for your assessment of those comments. and to ask you whether you think Jordan does risk at this stage being dragged into a broader regional conflict? Well, uh, first of all, Jordan is ready for any scenario. But being honest with you, at the time being, in the current situation, I really do not say. I, I do not see it. Uh, uh, it is, is, is it a possible scenario? Definitely it's a possible scenario. Is it going to happen? I think it is a little bit far-fetched, and uh, unless His Excellency, the, 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 the Foreign Minister of Turkey, has information, privilege to information, that I really personally do not have. But reading the map of the region, uh, I don't see it coming. What I see coming is that the government of Israel, especially the prime minister and his three, four cronies in, in, the, in the cabinet, uh, they are asking for a bigger war. They're pushing Lebanon to go into a war. And if you noticed in the coming three, four days, what has happened, uh, the targeting of Hezbollah, whether by rockets, whether by uh, jet fighters, whether by the pagers, whether by the communication equipment. And uh, your previous guest was very worried about a couple of missiles that were fired from uh, Hezbollah. So what, what is your assessment there with regards to the broadening of the conflict as far as Lebanon is concerned? I know you're not in Lebanon, but do you, do you see a broader war, therefore, developing on Israel's northern border with Lebanon and, and spilling over into, into the whole of Lebanon. Where, where would you see that heading? To be honest with you, I think what the Israelis is doing now is an extremely uncalculated risk. They've got an armed forces. They've been against all the doctrines of the Israeli forces. They've been in engagement for the past 11 months plus, 11 months, 10 days, I think. And I don't think they have the manpower, the morale, the determination to enter a full-scale war. A, but the political leadership, I think, who does not understand very much about military, only probably the Minister of Defense, 
but the other people have not served in the military. Or if they served, they served in a, in a clerkish uh, capacity. I think uh, they're pushing for, for, for uh, an all-out war with, with, with Hezbollah. They made a big mistake. And as I said, it's an uncalculated risk they're doing. And before Hezbollah was isolated, before the pagers issue and the radio communication issues and the raid on Lebanon proper, not on the southern part of Lebanon, I think they brought every Lebanese backing Hezbollah behind them in, 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 in protecting Lebanon. Uh, am I naive saying that uh, Lebanon and, and Hezbollah will, will, will prevail over Israel? Definitely not. Israel has the might, has the air power, has the sea power, which none of them has, and has the land power. But Hezbollah owns the land, and they know, land, and they know the land very well. And Hezbollah of 2006 is not the same Hezbollah in 2024. So uh, the rules of the game have changed. And I really pray that both sides become level-headed and not push the area into a higher tension, which could lead to regional disturbances. So what can the international community do to prevent that? very bleak scenario you just described from, from happening. What needs to be done? Well, I tell you, I don't think uh, Israel cares to what they do. Three days ago, there was a vote in the uh, uh, General Assembly where 124 uh, countries have uh, recognized, you know, in favor of the uh, of favor of Palestine, uh, 14 said nay and uh, 41 abstained. And uh, there is a lot of pressure on Israel and Israel is not listening. Israel is not listening to the United States. Israel is not listening to the United States at all. And, and, and as you stated earlier with your guest, uh, they're playing a very dangerous game that they're betting on the results of the elections. and. Uh, and I think they are taking also an uncalculated risk with this one. So just lastly, would you say that in terms of the diplomatic effort up until now with regards to Gaza uh, and, and striking a ceasefire deal, there hasn't been a ceasefire since November in, in Gaza, uh, would you say that the lack of success on that front, and we have seen Secretary of State Blinken go 10 times to the region trying to broker some sort of a deal, uh, but would you say that the lack of success on on that front is all down to the fact that um, the, the Israelis are not listening to the, the rest of the world. Is that what you're saying? First of all, definitely I agree with, with what you've stated on my behalf, 100% correct. And more importantly, uh, Western world led by the United States have many tools to use to pressure Israel, and they have not been using mainly power, uh, sorry, mainly munitions, mainly full supplies of arms, and uh, that they tell you we, we, we need to stop. There has to be a cessation of, uh, of, of, of fighting there, and at the same time, they're supplying weapons, they're supplying arms, and all that. And I think the US, the West has the capability to be an honest broker, but a full honest broker. You cannot be a, a, a go-between and, and someone who enforces a peace in the region and stability and being with one party against the other party. I believe the United States can and should uh, do that. The US always held the, the, the banner of humanity and uh, peace and stability in the region. And I think if it wants to be the leader of the free world as it preaches, it should start with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Okay, we're going to leave it there. Thank you very much indeed for taking the time to speak to us here on Al Arabiya News. The former Jordanian Minister of the Interior, Hossein Majali. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, sir. Thank you. From the White House to Gaza.
Kiev to Beijing. Elections, economics and the environment compete with conflicts and other complex issues for our attention. In an age of fake news, deep fake and artificial intelligence, they've got to have a vote and a say. It's important to look beyond the loudest voice to understand the truth. From newsmakers to groundbreakers, my campaign is going very well. Presidents, prime ministers, princes and peacemakers, and cultural tastemakers. As Arabs, as Middle Eastern, we're too emotional. Join me on The Rizkan Show for empowering conversation. Well, let's bring in our correspondent, Benji Hayer, who's standing by for us in Washington this afternoon. Benji, Israel says its uh, focus is shifting from Gaza to the northern border with Lebanon. And in the last few days, we've seen lots of evidence of uh, this new phase in Israel's strategy. Is this worrying Washington, do you think? It is, and it's led to a change of plans, in fact, even. Uh, Defence Secretary Lloyd Austin was due to go to Israel and, indeed, many other countries in the region next week. That trip has been cancelled in light of recent events, perhaps unsurprisingly. He was due to sit down with his counterpart, uh, Yoav Gallant, who was the one to declare this new phase of the war, uh, moving towards uh, the uh, border, of course, with Lebanon. And we've seen uh, that most recent exchange exchange of fire between uh, Israel and Hezbollah. Uh, it, it goes to show, I think, that the Biden administration is highly concerned by these events and it continues to call for a de-escalation. It has uh, expressed these um, uh, fears and concerns of an escalation uh, in tensions and violence, both publicly. We've seen uh, statements uh, go out uh, towards both parties, but also privately. And even though uh, there wasn't a forewarning from Israel towards the United States uh, regarding the walkie-talkie or the pager attacks in the last couple of days. There was still a brief communication between the Israeli government and the American government letting the United States know that there would be some operations being conducted. So the US being kept in the loop, but ultimately uh, their hope for that de-escalation of tensions uh, is not coming to bear. But we are, in fact, seeing that violence uh, ramp up in the past 24 hours or so. A very busy week for the US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, and in the last uh, 24 hours he's been holding talks with the top diplomats of some allied countries. Uh, what are his priorities right now? Well, just cast your mind back a couple of days to the uh, initial pager attack. Antony Blinken, the U.S. Secretary of State, was in Egypt. He was holding uh, talks uh, in relation to a possible ceasefire deal that the United States still wants to see signed between Israel and Hamas to uh, end the fighting, at least for now, in Gaza. He has since returned to Europe. He met on Thursday with the French foreign minister and said uh, at the time that he wants all parties, uh, in, you know, Hamas, Hezbollah, Israel, to maintain restraint uh, and avoid escalation. He, his officials, the US government more widely, is still pushing for that ceasefire deal, which they see as uh, interconnected with the escalation uh, between Israel and Lebanon, which uh, really ramped up, of course, following the Israel-Gaza war. And the hope, at least from Washington, is that a ceasefire deal would also help to bring down uh, the tensions to the north uh, of Israel. Israel, but ultimately the officials here uh, have made it clear that they uh, do not hold out much hope for a ceasefire deal being signed before the US presidential election uh, this coming November. OK, we've got the UN General Assembly in New York on Sunday. Uh, what can we expect to come out of that? Well, I think, you know, the, the presidential election in a couple of weeks will, will feature uh, very prominently, even though it's not necessarily the United Nations remit. But the fact that Donald Trump has made a number of comments in the past about how hostile he is towards these sort of international bodies, what he sees as their ineffectiveness. At the same time, you have Vice President and the Democratic Party's candidate Kamala Harris perhaps turning up to the summit in New York. So I think that there uh, will be that element that could... Uh, 
uh, be potentially overbearing uh, on the events that will be discussed. Uh, we see from the agenda that there are a variety of areas that are going to be covered. Climate change, nuclear disarmament, the Security Council's effectiveness, the fact that there are powers on there, be it US, be it China, be it Russia, who often veto any uh, sort of resolutions uh, regarding especially the war that we are seeing between Israel and Hamas in Gaza, or indeed uh, Ukraine and Russia. Uh, and on Israel, I think this will be a significant moment. Its Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, is due to be in attendance. And that's significant because his own country, his own state, is facing accusations of genocide by the International Court of Justice. That is a United Nations affiliated body. So uh, I think you can anticipate uh, widespread protests outside and perhaps some questions uh, directed towards uh, the Prime Minister uh, when he attends uh, in New York in a few days' time. And of course, uh, lastly, with, with the election uh, still very much in everybody's mind, the uh, Republican candidate uh, Donald Trump spoke yesterday at the Israeli-American uh, Council National Summit. That was in Washington. And he said that Jewish American voters are going to be partly to blame if he loses the election. Is that because he's trailing uh, behind Kamala Harris amongst uh, Jewish uh, voters there in the United States? Yes, and that's no different, I should say, from previous elections. You know, on the whole, if you look at polling, American Jews, uh, by a vast majority, support Democratic uh, candidates. Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton, by a ratio of about 70% to 30%, something that Donald Trump uh, clearly feels is unfair towards him. That amongst a series of uh, outlandish, remarkable comments that he made at two different events on Thursday night. One was actually regarding fighting anti Semitism. Yet it, it was at that event where he uh, made several comments uh, which uh, conflated Jewish people and the actions or the will of the Israeli government, which uh, many people see as an anti-Semitic trope. trope. He claimed that Israel would be, quote, totally annihilated, would be wiped off the face of the earth if he didn't win the presidential election in November. He said that the Democrats, the enemy, as he calls them, support Hamas. And then at that separate event that you mentioned literally down the road in Washington, he said, quote, and this is something he's mentioned before at his rallies, any Jewish person that votes for Kamala Harris is a fool, he said, and should have their head examined. He also veiled a sort of, uh, he also gave a, a sort of a veiled threat uh, towards Jews in the room and more widely around the United States when he said that they would be to blame, that they would have lots to do with his defeat if they don't vote for him. As I mentioned, most Jewish people in America are, are expected to side with Kamala Harris in this election. And those comments uh, that Donald Trump made last night condemned by Kamala Harris's husband, the uh, second gentleman, Doug Emhoff, who is Jewish, uh, and he called those remarks vile and anti-Semitic. OK, well, thank you very much indeed. Benji Heyer in Washington. Thank you for all that. That is all we have time for on Global News today. Thank you very much indeed for watching. Be sure to join us on Monday for more exclusive interviews and debate. Until then, goodbye.